All right, folks, welcome back. This is our 21st episode of the 2022 free ICT YouTube mentorship. A little tongue twisted there. <laughs> so we're looking at the hourly chart on the dollar index. Why are we here? Why are we looking at this? Well, I'm looking at this because I want to show you the relationships between a risk on and risk off market. Uh, if you've been following along in the comment section and if you haven't paid attention or even noticed all my videos in this mentorship, the comment section is open. Okay, so you're welcome to make your appreciation known. You're welcome to, you know, prompt me with specific questions that you want to see me kind of like touch on without making uh you know, too much of a, a long-winded request for it. I can kind of get a feel for what you're looking for, and I'll work those ideas into the lessons so that we can hopefully get everybody's understanding on the same page. I may not respond to your post. I may not, you know, directly answer you. Sometimes if it's short and easy, I'll do that. But if it's a question I see a lot of across the other videos as well, I use the videos to kind of like answer it. So it's important for you to take notes because usually you'll find that the questions you have are answered in the progression through this mentorship if you're coming here later than 2022. All right, so one of the questions I got, and I get this a lot for people that have not been trained by me, the idea of using the dollar index, is it useful like when I look at the Forex market, like if the dollar's going higher, obviously that's gonna put pressure on the foreign currencies, and it'll be less likely for them to have sustained rallies they're more likely to have sustained declines. So dollar up, foreign currency down. Dollar down, foreign currency up. Uh, the reason why that's occurring is it's a risk on risk off scenario. Dollar, if it is going up as we have here, this is a risk off scenario. Okay, risk off scenario implies that generally every other market or asset class will start to decline. And this is treated as like a flight to quality, okay, or a safe haven. So money pours into the dollar and it pours out of risk assets. That would be like foreign currency. That's why I've been telling you to look at the euro dollar to go lower and make a new low on this daily chart. And today it did it. And now it's random. And then also this applies as well to the stock market and index market. So obviously I'm kind of like pushing the index futures in this mentorship on YouTube, but it's applicable. Obviously everything I'm teaching here is universal. So it works in everything. Now I'm not co-signing crypto as a reminder. I do not trade cryptocurrency. I have absolutely zero experience trading cryptocurrency outside of a demo account or a paper trading account. I've never done anything with it. I've never opened up a crypto account. I have no interest in ever going into that asset class and there it is, okay? I, I see a lot of you asking that in the comment section, so I'm gonna try to throw this out there every now and then as a reminder, because <laughs> I don't do anything with that asset class. I have a lot of students that trade them, and they swear by my concepts working there, but I personally don't do it, okay? So there's that. Uh, I am a Forex and Futures trader, so that way you guys can know what my specialty is, and I wanna show you this chart here and remind you of what I mentioned in the previous week in our meetings together in the episodes. I said that we would likely see the dollar index drop down. If I was making the market for the dollar, I would see it go down to around 99.92. And you can go back and listen to the videos and it'll obviously just, you'll see it. It's there and hear it. Then I said I would run the relative equal highs and start to run it higher. I gave you the objectives of relative equal highs and mentioned like 102, 103, and you know, even my private mentorship group knows those objectives as well. And we have it here, okay? So I'll leave it up to you whether or not you find this inspiring or not, knowing that this was likely to occur for a London setup and then rally higher. I want you to look at the relationship between this price move here and go back in the commentary where I was referring to that daily bearish order block on the index feature. Okay, so I was talking about the, the low of the daily order block, the open of the order block, 
and the mean threshold halfway, and then the high of the order block being the less likely level to be traded to. And I'll talk about that when we get into the e mini S&P portion of this episode. But for now, let's take a look at what the relationship looks like with the dollar versus the e mini S&P. So this is the June contract for 2022 of the e mini S&P futures market. And you can see as the dollar creates its important low that I called publicly, you guys know it, I've said it, I explained it to you in detail. As this dollar was going higher, what was going on in the e-mini S&P? See that inverted relationship there? That's why if you go back and listen to the recording, when I was talking about that bearish order block on the e-mini S&P, I said that we're going into May and it's usually a seasonal decline. And I'm going to be looking for signatures to warrant downward pressure in this particular asset class and reaching for those relative equal lows on the daily chart. Hello, look at your chart, folks. This is this is what it's like to be mentored. This is what it's like to know what's likely to occur with tools that make sense. There's nothing ambiguous here. There's nothing, you know, splattered across the chart. It's just simple, sound logic. Okay. I'm hopefully inspiring you to simplify, which many on the outside looking at what I do will make snide remarks like, oh, he overcomplicates things. And I'm not complicating anything. These are very simple ideas and it helps you build the idea of bias. It gives you intermarket relationships and intermarket analysis to give you the the trust. Okay. Why did I feel you know confident to publicly say that 99.92 level? Well I explained that. Why did I think it was going to rally from there? Because I'm bullish on dollar. Why did I hint that we're going to be going lower into the e mini S&P relative equal lows and as we enter into May? That's a seasonal tendency. So all those factors came together. And my experience of almost 30 years was used to hint at something for you to study. And if I'm right or if I'm wrong, you get to be a judge. Okay, you get to see and weigh me in the balances. I've laid it out there in your hands. You see right now in this chart, what I was forecasting, the reasons why I was doing it, why I said what I said, and why it looks like it does in your chart today. All right, so here's that daily chart, and here's that bearish order block I was referring to, and the high I said is the level we don't look for it to be traded to, and you can see we didn't even get to it there. Okay, so we route up into the order block, and then we had the weakness that was expected as we go into that May month, and we're reaching into these relative equal lows. That's the next draw on liquidity, but for now, again, just keep your study inside this order block that's taught in this YouTube channel, okay? So while it's not a main factor in the model I'm teaching in the mentorship for YouTube here, I leaned on that as a basis for my analysis. Why I felt this was likely to go lower, that's the order block, that's the one that makes the likelihood of the market turning it in this area and then going lower and attacking the sell side below here below the relative equal lows here is next and then this low here so ultimately we're looking for a run below here for the sell side now it might want to go down below here and give a little bit of a retracement if it leaves this portion open that might want to rally from going over here up there i don't think it would do that personally but it could happen but it's likely to you know, draw into that old low here. Now, how we trade once we get there, that'll be interesting because I don't know if it's going to accelerate violently to the downside or if we're going to have a sharp retracement higher. I don't know that. Okay, I don't care to know that. Right now, I'm just looking for and submitting to the idea that we're going to keep drawing down on the daily chart. Each daily candle should be expanding lower and reaching into this area. Okay, that's what I'm expecting. That's my ideal scenario. Now, if you look at the daily range here today, we had a little bit of movement above the previous day. So we rallied above Monday's high and then failed, accelerated to the downside. Fell short of just running below these relative equal lows, but I still believe that's where we're likely to go. Had a little bit of consolidation in here, dropped. And we had a nice rally in here. Now, admittedly, listen closely, folks, because this is one of those times where I didn't get it right. 
and I have no problem telling you. I was expecting this to rally just a little bit higher and maybe flirt with that 4320 level. I thought that we could get one more spike up into that and then I was expecting the rollover and go lower. That did not happen. Okay, so let's go into the lower time frame, 15 minute time frame. And here is the midnight hour, New York time, and the opening price there. Notice we only had one, two little moves above that. And that's a really anemic movement for what I was expecting, a little bit more pronounced rally higher. I wanted to see a little bit of a Judas swing, about 20 handles, 15 handles to that effect like that, and then break down and create something like this. Okay, but we didn't get it. So some of you may be asking, and I believe it was Michelle in the comment section, mentioned that uh, it didn't appear that Power 3 was in effect today. It actually was, but sometimes it's really, really small little movements like this, and it may not be useful to you. But what happens is when you enter the London session, which we do here, on well, 3 o'clock in the morning, it breaks down relative to New York local time. Okay, so 3 a.m. New York local time. There's a lot of folks in the comment section that are referring to and confused about daylight savings time and such. All of that is resolved if you simply just listen to the instruction I gave every single time I mentioned the time aspect. If you use this little area down here in trading view and toggle it to New York, and all you gotta do is by clicking it, a window will pop up, scroll to where it says New York, you know, highlight that one, click it, and then you're set. You don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about daylight savings time. Don't worry about you know anything. As long as you are aware of what local time is in New York, set a clock on your computer that always tracks the local time in New York, 24-7, 365 days a year. If you do that, you'll never have any confusion about what you should be doing relative to time. Okay. So if you have a small little movement like this, it can throw you off if you're expecting, like I was. I wanted to see a little bit higher rally. So in the morning, I was looking for maybe a little poke above here. Didn't happen. We broke down, retraced back in, bearish order block, and the imbalance, and spent a little bit of time here, and then rolled over right before the 9.30 opening. Okay, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the 8.30 and the 9.30, what times you know, are useful, what are they beneficial to, your analysis and what you should be concerned about. Okay, because I know there's a lot of questions about that. But ultimately, we moved into the lunch hour, had a little bit of retracement in here, broke down once more, and then aggressive selling, really aggressive selling into the PM session, into the close of the day. If you look at the opening price at midnight local time, New, I'm sorry, New York midnight local time, that's what this here is. That's that opening price. This price is useful for trading the London session. That's 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning, New York local time. And it helps me frame the power three for the daily range. If I'm bearish, I'm looking for something to rally above that opening price in London. That's my ideal scenario. I'm looking for that personally. As you can see, we really didn't get much of that today. It was extremely heavy and just wilted and went lower. Sometimes that's going to happen, folks. And in this instance, I missed a setup. I don't get in what I'm thinking I'm expecting to see. So I'm human. You're human. You're going to look at something in the chart and you're going to have something that is your favorite model, uh, whatever pattern it is you're looking for. And it may not even be my stuff. You know, say you're just here casually watching you're probably nodding your head saying, yeah, I've had lots of instances where I was looking for my particular setup and it didn't materialize and it went the other way without me. You're going to miss moves. You're going to misinterpret it. You're going to read it wrong. That's going to happen. That's why you have to use a stop loss. That's why you have to be controlled about how many times you go into the marketplace. And you also have to have some measure of flexibility. And that comes with experience. You're not going to always be able to see that this isn't going to go up for you initially. It's just going to just wilt and go the other direction. So when we get into the 830 hour, and I have the lines really light here because I want to be able to show where the highs and the lows were on the respective candles. So this is the 830 and this is the 12 a.m. midnight 
candle at New York. So this is New York, and this is midnight New York. So there's a distinction there. The beginning of the day, this is where I look for the daily range power three setup and or the ideal scenario if I'm bearish, I want to see something rally above that opening price. If I'm bullish, I want to see it decline below that opening price. Okay, That's pretty much the basis for the opening price at midnight. It may not be a factor for you like it is here. It's not much of a use you know, for anything except for, well, here it opened and it just basically went lower from there. At 8.30, the same thing. I look for those types of scenarios. I'm now I'm looking for weaker prices. I'm looking for it to trade lower. And does it rally above the 8.30 opening price? It never does. It's too heavy. It just wilts. Okay, it keeps going lower. Now, the opening price at 8.30, I use that for, again, power three for the New York session. The same thought process that I'm using for the opening price at midnight in New York time, that opening price, if I'm bearish, I want to see a move above that. That's what I dub a Judas swing, a false rally or a suspect rally. I usually like to fade those types of moves. As it goes up, I sell right into it. And it's scary for someone that doesn't understand what you're looking at. But if you know what you're looking for, and it takes a lot of experience and learning and back testing and seeing things, you'll be able to do those types of things over time. But that same element of trying to look for a short above that opening price in New York when I'm bearish, I would expect the same thing to happen for the New York session, a rally above that opening price at 8.30, and then decline. So I'm looking for something to rally above that and fade it, but it isn't doing it today. So now look what's occurring here. This is really important that you understand this part of it. You know that I've been bearish. I've made it public knowledge here. Did we rally above the opening price at midnight? No. Did we rally above the opening price at 8.30? No. And we're bearish. What does that indicate to you? Obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, it's extremely bearish. It can't even rally to a short-term premium above the opening price at key levels and time. So we have an extremely heavy bearish market. So it's not going to give us these stunning little short-term rallies that we can fade. It's just going to stay heavy and either you get in where you can find small little pockets of imbalance or you miss the move entirely. Now, as it happens today, my wife went on a trip. I had to take her to the airport. I was only able to capture $2,000 worth of movement in the S&P E-mini. That's the only thing I could capture. When I got back, I didn't participate in the afternoon, and looking at it now, I missed a really, really huge opportunity. There was no trading whatsoever in the afternoon. My money was made short on the e s and in the morning session, and that's all I had for today. If I would have just held on to what I had in the morning, you know, I could have done around $12,000 today alone, but I didn't hold on to it. I had other things to take care of. And that's, that's the reality of things. You know, real life creeps in, it's going to happen. But for those of you that are trying to learn these concepts, these types of movements are going to be very frustrating in the early stages of your development because you're going to feel like they're changing something. They're aware of this. It, it's, this stuff goes on a lot. It happens in the futures markets, like commodities like corn, soybeans, gold, oil, um, stocks, you know, sometimes the markets are just simply too heavy and they're not going to rally for you Okay, to, to short into. It doesn't mean that they've changed anything. It doesn't mean that the concepts don't work. It just means that this is a market that is extremely bearish. And when it's extremely bearish, you have to trade it differently. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that here. And I'm not trying to inspire much outside of the mentorship, but I know some of you have asked this in the comment section, plus it helps my own personal group to understand this as well. So it'll be a little bit of a refresher for them. All right, so here's the London Open setup. This was the move that set up the only real sound entry, in my opinion, that took place today here. This displacement, fair value gap, 
rallies up, fair shoulder block, fair value gap, runs into it, and then you hold it. Because at the market structure, shift below the short-term low, the imbalance, we run back up in. This imbalance here, remember what I taught you about this? This one here can be traded to on a spike. It can get up in there, but your entry is on the lower fair value gap. Do you see the logic working here? You are going to use a stop that's going to allow for the market trading up into this one. So you may not like that much risk. You may not be able to take this trade. That's all part of this game. But you can trade a micro, or maybe you could. I shouldn't say that you can. I, mean, I don't know what all of your, your risk parameters are, what you can work with in terms of margin. But while you're learning in paper trading, obviously, you, you can use anything because it's all hypothetical money and you're learning the skill set but the rules are still sticking to what i gave you in terms of the logic if you have two fair value gaps you're using this as the entry and you're using this as the risk don't always assume that you can get up here and get the best entry because it never went there see that so it's things like this this is what i refer to as a signature in price action these are algorithmic things that repeat but you have to have the discernment and experience and know when it's likely to occur, when it isn't likely to occur. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about the 8.30 time period and 9.30. All right, so here's 8.30. Got the imbalance here. After 8.30, now normally with the model, I'm teaching you to look for something to the left prior to 8.30. Some kind of short-term high, we wanna see it rally up. And using the opening price at 8.30, which is here, we want to see it rally above that, run some stops, then break down and create this type of scenario where it has displacement and a imbalance. It rallies back up into the imbalance and sells off. The model doesn't exist in today's price action on the five minute chart. It doesn't give it to you there. Okay, so I'm going to give you coaching, if you will, to kind of like show you what was in price and some of the things I was looking at to help get in sync with the move, but I didn't ride the whole thing out. Okay, and believe me, I'm looking at this today <laughs> wishing I just would have had at least one of the two contracts I had on on still and just let it run. And I could have done, you know, about eight grand or so. But I didn't do it. Okay, uh, I was leaving. I was taking my wife to the airport. And it's just better if you're not going to be in front of the charts and anything can happen. You know, I could get delayed out there. The phone doesn't connect with the, you know, the broker. It's just better just to be away. If you're not going to be paying attention to the marketplace, just simply completely close the entire position. Also, I'll throw this in here too. Uh, or shortly before I started doing the recording here, I saw a question, do I ever hold overnight in these current conditions? I stopped holding overnight like 24 hours years ago. We had a lot of things going on in the world that changed my trust just like I used to hold things over the weekend and expect you know, continuation going into the opening on Sunday and Monday, I no longer hold over the weekend. So I am 100% in a session or a day and out before the close. Like I'm not holding 24 hours. I'm not holding 12 hours. You know, I'm not doing those types of positions. Typically my trade is anywhere between 90 minutes to two hours maximum. That's about the the, the length of time that I'm holding and I'm, I'm looking to take mine and get out and then reassess things because there's just too much risk right now in the marketplace, all asset classes, and things are now starting to get a little wild and it could get a little bit more wilder. <laughs> okay. But the five minute chart has the imbalance in here. We saw that run and the model, I want to see it run above the opening price at 830. The opening price at 8.30 is the New York Sessions opening price. Now, don't get confused with the New York Midnight Candles opening price because the New York Association in the, in the name, New York Session is the 8.30 to 11 time period, New York local time. So I'm looking for this framework to offer Power 3, which is a fractal element of accumulation, manipulation and distribution. That's what power three, the three things that is empowering you is understanding those three elements. Accumulation, what's accumulating? Short positions, okay? Why? Because it's bearish. So smart money would accumulate short positions. 
then anticipate manipulation above the opening price. They would assume more short positions there. Then it starts to go the other direction and they distribute their short positions at some important low that's that we're able to forecast and obviously it's relative to those daily equal lows and old daily lows and projections with the fib all those ideas come to mind in concert with in agreement as well with time of day okay so we're looking at a movement down into around the lunch hour beginning at noon okay it creates the important low there we have a retracement during the lunch hour one more time it punches above the high here then it breaks down Consolidate starts create one, two, three, and then you can expect continuation going into the afternoon session. We're not going to talk about the afternoon session because honestly, I wasn't participating in it and it is what it is. I'm familiar with this morning because I had some horses in the race today. Okay, so we'll start getting a little bit more detail here. Here we have the four minute chart, the imbalance here. This is one again that is not rallying above the opening price at 8.30. Now it's showing 8.28, but that's because I'm showing a four minute chart. So don't let that confuse you. But the opening price, again, never got traded above at the 8.30 candle. So whatever that opening price is at 8.30, you extend that out in time and you wanna see that rally above. Now, when you have this expectation, the other aspect of time is the 9.30 opening. That's when the equity market or stocks themselves start trading their New York session. So what happens at 9.30? What am I expecting at 9.30? Well, no, number one, 9.30 is just when the opening occurs and there's initial volatility. Now it could be whipsaw where it can go up and down real short term and go both directions in a small range. Sometimes it could be a really large range and clear both sides of the buy and sell and then whatever the real move is going to be for the day, we wait for that to unfold. Today, we can see at 930, it just starts to run lower. It doesn't give us a rally at all. So it just starts to speed up what's already in motion from 3 o'clock in the morning during the London Open session. So at 930, all it does is just start to accelerate down. Okay, and the same idea is being shown on a three minute chart. You can see here that little imbalance gets a little bit more refined, trades up into it rather handsomely, breaks down, and here's another, if everybody got with a bearish order block. Now this is one in here where it's useful because you have a little bit more insight as to what it's doing. It's too heavy, it's not likely to rally. There's no reason to look to go long, start looking for reasons to get short. And anytime you get an imbalance, and we're above those relative equal lows on the daily chart because it's going to be draw down into that. That's the that's the heaviness objective. Okay, why the prices keep going lower, 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 lower is because they're gravitating towards those relative equal lows on the daily chart. Okay, so go back to the chart where I mentioned in this video and showed the daily chart. I had that little blue line. That's where price is being drawn to. Okay, the algorithm is marching every minute, every hour, every day to that level. How long does it take to get there? I don't know that. But I mentioned in my group that I didn't want to see it happen like we're seeing it right now because it's it's too fast and it doesn't give it a lot of opportunities to get in with it and ride it. So you either have to have entries like this, which unfortunately isn't scalable with the model I've shared publicly, but I do have obviously opportunities to go over it like this and show you that how you can still use the idea of the fair value gap to get in with it, but you're going to have to leave out the element of a rally above the opening price at 8.30 and 9.30 just creates a lot of volatility. Okay, uh, The initial surge in the New York session as the stocks begin to trade it basically. So as a recap here, before I go into the next slide, midnight New York time, that opening price, I use that to trade the London open session. That's two o'clock to five o'clock in the morning. 
and also to help frame the idea, like say I sleep through London, which is 90% of the time what I do today. Like I don't do a lot of London session trading. And because of that, when I wake up and I'm looking at the market around seven o'clock in the morning or so, I'm looking at what has happened overnight. And did we create a scenario that I would be looking to trade if I was awake during London? If it happens, then I know that I'm really built in with an advantage on the daily bias because if I'm bearish and it creates a, a rally above the opening price, midnight time, New York, and it creates that rally, that little Judas swing that I've explained many times already, and it starts to decline and I'm below that around seven o'clock in the morning, I know that I'm likely to create another little short-term rally, but it would be above, ideally above the opening price at 8.30. But it may not do that. And price just remained heavy below both opening prices at midnight New York local time and 8.30 New York local time. So everything was extremely bearish and it was just so heavy it could not mount any meaningful rallies. Many times in my early development, I got crushed on days like this, where it, it felt like, okay, it's too, too low now. It, it can't just keep going lower. So I'm going to try to buy it now. Because, you know, indicators told me that we're oversold. 1992, 1993, 1994, I blew account after account after account doing that. And it's frustrating. Now, obviously, with three decades of experience behind me, I know what it's trying to do and where it's trying to get to. And it's getting there in a really fast rate of speed. Now, obviously, you can get there a lot faster than that, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want it to do that because it, it gives no real opportunity for me to engage and participate in. And it doesn't give you, as the student, to engage also with your demo or paper trading account to practice. But as real life sometimes is, it's unfair, okay? It doesn't give us what we want. Sometimes our expectations and our wants are denied. And in today's climate, that is not popular. That's why this market and trading these markets is very, very difficult, especially for like the millennials, okay? That ideal, perfect, always come exactly as I expect it, sometimes is denied and either you accept that and navigate the markets with imperfection and without the ideal scenario for your model or you're comfortable with just letting go and not doing anything and being accepting when it comes to big moves and you can't participate in it. There's lots of moves folks over the last 30 years that I missed that were huge, big, huge moves. For instance, Bitcoin. I called that thing. I called that thing at 7,500 to 20,000. And then right before 20,000, I said it wasn't going to 20,000. It was 19,700. And I said, it's going to go to 6,000. And everybody laughed and went down. And I said, I was going to go down 3,000, but it went down to like 32. And then I think a couple times I, um, I had it wrong publicly. And then I said that we would go to 20,000 by Christmas, I think it was uh, 2020. And then I said 30,000 by New Year's and I was off by about 18 hours. It went to 30,000 on the second, I believe it was on January, 2021. And then I said 55,000 and 66,000. That was about as far as I could see it go. And we went just a little bit above 66,000 and hasn't been doing much since. But I didn't do anything with that with real money. So I missed a huge run in something that would have otherwise paid out a lot of money. And I've missed a lot of moves in the futures markets and a lot of commodities. I missed a lot of stock moves, you know, while I was teaching Forex. There's a lot of stock movement and in index futures that I didn't participate in. Guess what? It's okay. I'm able to still find trades. I'm not starving. And that's the... The reality, you're going to have to come to terms and the grip with you have no way of participating in every single move. And don't think that you're going to find every big move. You're not going to participate in every single price swing. You're not going to, folks. I miss moves. You're going to miss moves. And it's okay. It's part of this game. 
This business is going to still run and do the same things we're looking for all the time. And you're not going to participate in every move. Okay. So give yourself the permission. Okay. To be human. You're going to do it wrong. Sometimes you're going to see it for something. It's not. And you're going to miss that big move. I had a little piece of this today, but I didn't get the whole thing. I wish I would have, but I, I didn't. And it's okay. I forgive myself for, for being a good husband and taking my wife to the airport. I know this is all too much stuff and you don't care. Some of you like to say those things in the comments. Get to the point. The point is, you do this, you're going to have these elements creep in. And how are you going to deal with it? You're going to get mad and go on social media and you know, blurt out and curse and say, these markets suck. <laughs> no, that's not what you should be doing. You should just reason with yourself ahead of time. Say, okay, I'm not going to be able to do everything. I'm not going to participate in every single move. And this is what happens sometimes. It doesn't mean the model's broken. I promise you, in over the next couple of weeks, you're going to see the model delivering like it's done in the past. And it's fine. It's going to, there's going to be times when the market shifts in and out and the market structure is just too overwhelmingly bullish or too overwhelmingly bearish. In this instance, you know, the bearishness I gave you guys just was a lot more bearish than the model would permit for entry. But you can see there's fair value gaps in here you could use to participate. Dropping down to two-minute chart, you can see again, refined in real nice here. And then once more in here. And then drop down into that noon time, creating an important low, which is what I taught you in this mentorship already. In that two-minute imbalance, you can see on the one-minute chart here and here. Really nice delivery there. And these are just simple little imbalances to get in sync with what is already in motion. Not needing to see it rally above the 830 opening price because it's not likely to. So it takes a little bit of courage to get in here and trade these types of setups. But that's what you do. Or you don't do anything. And you just tape read. You watch it when it does it and say, okay, I would like to see it drop here. And does it drop? Yes. And you study that and it gives you another fair day gap in here that's not highlighted and it rallies up to a bear shoulder block and sells off and your stop is above here and just because it goes down lower doesn't mean jam your stop loss to here because that's what happens you need to have time and price behind you before you start moving your stop loss and ultimately trades obviously lower into that noon time all right so i think that's going to be it uh the next episode on Thursday, I'm going to show you a couple things inside the trading platform on TradingView that I think are useful, It that answers a few things. And one of the students made mention that could I literally go in and show how to set up the Fibonacci. So I thought it was kind of simple already, but obviously some of you are really, really new and you're not familiar with the TradingView platform, so I'm going to add that at the end of the video on Thursday coming up. Okay, so that way it's at the end, and anybody that already knows how to do it, they don't have to go through and watch all that stuff. But I'll give you another teaching and lesson, obviously, on Thursday. And until I talk to you then, be safe.